Our subject is testing our spiritual wisdom. The uh, writer of this epistle, as I've been saying in recent studies, very probably the first piece of New Testament literature written probably before the Gospels, certainly before all the other epistles, the epistles of Paul and of Peter, this first item of New Testament literature, an inspired letter written by James, who for 30 years was pastor of the church at Jerusalem, reflects very strongly the teaching, the pulpit teaching of the very earliest believers. And here we come to the teaching on spiritual wisdom. What is spiritual wisdom? There's a question asked, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? And in a moment, we'll be talking about that word knowledge, which is a very special word in the Greek. <clears throat> it is used only in this place in the New Testament. It's a word with a very distinctive meaning an application, and it's very significant that James should use it, but we'll come to that. Who is a wise man is a challenge here and endued with knowledge among you. It follows verses 10 to 12, which is a picture of the inconsistent believer. <clears throat> In fact, the impossible picture, a believer who is like this, is very probably not a, b a believer. I suppose it is possible when we are extremely backslidden, but I'll read these depressing verses. Verse 10, out is this a person, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter, a spring? proved to be so unreliable that one moment it is good water and the next moment poisoned water, unsuitable water. Verse 12, can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, the wrong fruit? Well, that's followed by verse 13, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge. The picture was of an inconsistent believer. <clears throat> That believer is out of control. That believer is a split person. That believer is to be pitied. He's an object of foolishness. I am a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ. I have come to him and I have sought forgiveness of sin and asked for new life. And he says the right things. And yet his behavior is a total contradiction. And he makes a fool of himself constantly in that respect. No, the opposite of that sort of foolishness, of inconsistency, is wisdom. Verse 13, who, here's the contrast, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? The wise is not laughable, pitiable, a contradiction. The wise person sees clearly, sees the consequences of his action, restrains his temper, controls himself, he sees the objectives of the Christian life, he sees the helps available to him from the Lord and he employs them. So we need to explore this and how. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge? What does this unusual word knowledge mean? Well, some say comprehension. But the majority say, from its use in classical Greek, it would refer to a kind of specialized knowledge. Intelligence, it's often translated. Who is a wise man? Significance of this will become very clear and endued with intelligence among you. Not personal intelligence. We're not talking about that. <laughs> I... Uh, <clears throat> Remember, years and years ago, I'm going back over half a century, I had a friend, and we were all called up in those days, and when this friend was called up, what do you think he was put in? He was put in the intelligence corps, and he rather assumed it was because he was intelligent. 
Well, it, of course, as soon as he went in and to his basic training and so on, the first thing he was told is, well, we hope you're intelligent, all of you, but we can't guarantee it. Intelligence doesn't refer to you. It refers to the specialised knowledge which our core is committed to acquire. The intelligence applies to that specialised knowledge of the enemy that any army needs in order to uh, conquer, in order to gain victory. It refers to the famous where, how and when. That's intelligence, the body of knowledge which tells you where will the enemy strike, how will he strike and when will he strike. And the intelligence corps, of course, has to try to obtain and to file and collect information about the enemy. The strength that he has, the quality of the arms and of the troops. Are they new recruits? Are they seasoned soldiers? The commanders in charge and what their favorite strategies are and all sorts of things like that. Battlefield analysis is something they make much of, analyzing the whole field of battle so that if, there has to, if it has to be invaded, all the difficulties and pitfalls are known and the problems that may even the local people, will they be helpful or will they be dangerous? And how they get this information, perhaps by the interception of enemy messages and the decoding of them and so on, and they build up knowledge. And that knowledge is called intelligence. So it's not so much the... Uh, the soldier who is in the intelligence corps, well, we hope he's intelligent, but the intelligence refers to the mass of information they're acquiring. Any given soldier may only be a filing clerk or something of that order. And James uses a word remarkably like this. Who among you as Christians is endued with intelligence, knowledge of the scene, knowledge of the warfare, Knowledge of the enemy. That's how he uses the term. <clears throat> of course, any trade would do, really. Let's take a plasterer. You've got a ceiling and it's come down. And you need needs to be plastered. Well, if you or I attempted it, if we did it, I should think we'd have more plaster on our heads than on the ceiling. The thing is baffling. How do they get it up there? And how do they get it to defy gravity and stay up there? Well, they know how to do it. They just know. And they've acquired the art, the knowledge of how to do it. That's a specialized knowledge. Most people don't have it. And that's the way James uses the word. Is there a wise Christian among you? He doesn't imply there are very few, but he puts it as a challenge. Is there a wise believer with intelligence, not personal intelligence, but a knowledge of what goes on in the Christian life, what you need to know, how the enemy will strike at you, understanding of his wiles, the wiles of Satan. Is there somebody who's really mature in these things? He knows the pitfalls. He knows the means of defense. He knows the ways in which we gain the help of the Holy Spirit and of the Savior. He knows how to handle his moods in a spiritual manner. He knows how to stay close to the Lord when all the influences would drive you away. Do you have the intelligence, the knowledge that you need of the enemy's methods, strategies and wiles and all that? Now that's what James is talking about. He's using the word in that interesting and specialized way. Who is a wise man or woman or young person, spiritually wise, and endued with knowledge, intelligence, how to cope. Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. What an amazing statement this is. Let him show it. <clears throat> We're not setting a test. Answer the following questions. That's not a helpful way. That won't show if you've got this wisdom and you know how to use it. You could give a lecture 
on sanctification and improvement of character, and yet you could completely fail to accomplish this in your own life. So James says, don't let him tell you what he knows, just look at his life. Let him show it out of his behavior. And the word in our King James Version, behavior, uh, rather uh, conversation, means not only words, speech, but total behavior. That's what the word means. It's changed its meaning over the years, and it's now limited only to verbal conversation. Let him show out of good conduct. Good interaction is actually the best translation of the word. It is about interaction. So that's why it became more and more to do with verbal conversation. But interaction with all the circumstances of life, how you interact with life and people, how you behave, how you handle life. If you have spiritual wisdom, it'll be obvious. It'll show you'll react well to all the pressures and in a spiritual and in a prayerful way. That's what James is telling us. <clears throat> Let him show out of a good conversation his works, his acts, with meekness of wisdom. So, friends, this is the golden element of it. No self-promotion. Servant spirit willing, if necessary, to be wronged. Oh, there's a person who knows. There's a person with spiritual wisdom. He can handle his difficulties and his circumstances. He can react well under different pressures. He doesn't uh, become testy and lose his temper. He's a godly man. She's a godly woman in all circumstances. And at the same time, no self-promotion. A humble person. It is an awful thing and a sad thing that today, even among ministers very often in the churches at large, you see how people behave. They strut up and down. They show off enormously. They've learned the wisdom of the world, not the wisdom of the spirit the wisdom we'll read of that descends from above. Oh, to be successful, you've got to project yourself. You've got to be the big chap. You've got to be admired physically and in everything you do, you've got to be over the top and flamboyant and so on. And you've got a lot of this coming into the Christian churches. James will argue completely the other way. No, the wisdom which comes from above is humble and not self-projecting and self-promoting. In fact, he says, contrary to what some people think, the person who will even win the souls that have real character and are truly saved will be the person who goes about it in a more humble way and not self-promoting way. And that's what we're going to read about here. So it's a very challenging passage. Verse 13, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge, intelligence, of spiritual things among you. Let him show out of good conduct, behavior, interaction with the affairs of life, his acts, his works, with meekness of wisdom. Now the opposite that I've been mentioning, and we'll deal very briefly with this because <clears throat> it's not a pleasant subject. Verse 14, but if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, Glory not and lie not against the truth. And then that type of wisdom is defined. <clears throat> Bitter envying. That uh, word translated bitter means zealous, really. Hot, zealous, envying. This person who comes to be driven by jealousies. I want the notice that that other person is given given. I want the attention that other person gets. I'm saved by Christ. I'm in the church, but I want things for myself. I want to be well thought of. I want to be noticed. Oh, James wants to demonstrate how inappropriate 
and contrary to spiritual wisdom and behavior, that is, if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, that is, battling ambition, glory not, don't be proud of what you're doing, and lie not against the truth. Oh, go before the Lord and say, what's happening to me, Lord? I'm being consumed by unspiritual, fallen attitudes. Save me from all this. Don't lie and think, aren't I doing well? People are pleased with me. I get noticed this way. So James feels compelled to keep his own church at Jerusalem pure and to urge Christians everywhere to see bitter envying and uh, strife or battling ambition as evil and injurious. Verse 15, this wisdom, he calls it wisdom. It is a form of wisdom, you see. There's a policy behind it. How am I going to get on? How am I going to uh, uh, feel contented and happy and fulfilled? Oh, I'm going to aim at being significant and noticed and applauded. It's a policy. It's not just an accident that people behave like this. It's a form of wisdom. It's a very worldly wisdom. But instead of spiritual wisdom, they've adopted worldly wisdom. Be self-confident, project yourself, be noticed, feel good about yourself, and all this type of thing. There's a wisdom in it of sorts, but it's carnal wisdom. It's not our wisdom. <clears throat> this wisdom, verse 15, descendeth not from above. It doesn't come from heaven. It doesn't come from the Bible, which is God's word revealed from heaven. It doesn't come from Christ who revealed from heaven perfect character and holiness. We'll come to that. But it's earthly, sensual, for me, for how I feel, devilish. It's Satan and his agents who are egging me on to behave like that. Verse 16, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion. Read disorder, if you like, for confusion. There is disorder and every evil work. That is to say, every harmful work. The word translated evil there in verse 16 is quite interesting. It doesn't actually refer to moral evil. It refers to things that are base and worthless. So many base and worthless things come in to any Christian gathering or society where what I want, how I feel, getting attention to myself comes in. Don't you see it today? Oh, the foolishness of so many of our churches, even that believe the gospel. And I, I know I say this sort of thing to you often, but don't you see it even here? They bring in worldly entertainment methods. And people sway about in front of audiences and show off their instrumental expertise and behave just like worldly stars. How foolish! The opposite of spiritual wisdom, where the minister conducts himself in, with modesty and humility, and God's word is what counts, and God must increase and he must decrease. And it's the word we want to persuade people of and get across. No, individuals, look at me, look at me, look at me. Look at how I resemble this great star or that great star. Isn't it so foolish? Isn't it obvious that that's going to bring into the churches every base, worthless, worldly thing? Performance, pride, self-adulation, Focus on people and what people can do. Isn't it so, so obvious? It's forbidden in the scripture. And even if it wasn't, which it is, it would be the most senseless, unintelligent, foolish thing to do. And yet people are doing it wholesale in the churches. 
And that is why the Holy Spirit is withdrawing. We know it because he will not compete with the wisdom of man in the church. He will withdraw. And the more you get worldly wisdom in the church, the less you will get of any blessing of God and God gradually withdraws. And all over the world, this charismatic movement and contemporary Christian music movement and all this sort of thing is the herald of a decline in theology and in commitment to Christ. And then another movement crops up, the new Calvinism. Oh no, we, we herald Calvinistic doctrines and yet we do the same worldly things. How foolish. They've got the evidence in front of their eyes that this is destructive and that this brings down. But I want to point it out to you, it's here in the epistle of James, exactly the same, verse 15. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every baseless, worthless activity comes in. Of course it does, because people want to suit themselves. I want what I like, I want what suits me. So everything comes in. Friends, let's go on. Verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Dear friends, the wisdom that is from above Oh, first of all, though this is not what James has in mind, well, he does have it in mind, I'm sure, but it's not the first point of his, uh, uh, his teaching. <clears throat> the wisdom that comes from above is Christ. So we can uh, worthily digress for a moment or two. Christ the Lord, our Saviour, he is the wisdom that comes from above, promised throughout the Old Testament, described in terms of wisdom, the embodiment of wisdom in the book of Proverbs, the wisdom that comes from above. Look at the characteristics of wisdom here, and certainly Christ answers to them. The wisdom that is from above, verse 17, is first pure. Oh, not only was Christ perfectly holy, but he came with perfect motives. He came for us. He came to win a people. He came in compassion and kindness and mercy. He came to purchase souls by the shedding of his own blood. He came to make it possible for him to forgive billions of people throughout the entire history of the world by taking their punishment due the punishment due to them upon himself on Calvary's cross. He came with the purest, purest of motives and intentions and nothing ever deflected him from this work of redemption and salvation. The wisdom who is Christ, who comes from above, is pure. Why did he come? For himself? Could he add something to himself? Of course not. He has everything that he could conceivably wish. He came for us entirely. The wisdom that comes from above, verse 17, is first pure, then peaceable. His life on earth was not for himself. It was a substitutionary life. He lived a perfect and holy life, voluntarily subjecting himself to the law of God on earth and to his Father. For us, he was the supreme peacemaker, peaceable. He uh, came to make a substitutionary atonement for us, to join us to himself, to make peace between God and man, between God and the redeemed. First pure, then peaceable, then gentle, how gentle was Christ, even when he was severe in his words. 
There was a gentleness in his severity. I didn't mean to digress into this, but the Lord Jesus Christ on occasions denounced the scribes and the Pharisees and he reproved their hypocrisy in the strongest terms. Was he being gentle? Oh, yes. Because there were thousands of people who would hear him and thousands of people who would read the account of this who by these words were delivered from the stranglehold that the scribes and the Pharisees had over them. The scribes and the Pharisees taught salvation by works, through ritual and so on. And the people thought they are the people. They are our betters. They know they are the clergy, as it were, of the Jewish church. What they say must be right. And it was only by denouncing these that Christ was able to release so much kindness to people who were released from the hold and the veneration they had for the scribes and the Pharisees. And he was kind even to them because many of them, we never lose sight of this, many of them believed in him. Oh, they were nervous as kittens. They were nervous believers. They didn't want to be deposed and thrown out of the temple and synagogues. So, but nevertheless, we repeatedly read, many of them believed on him. Why do you think they believed? Sometimes because of the stinging, stinging words of Christ against the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees and by the work of the Spirit, the hearts of many of them were searched and challenged and it brought them to belief in Christ also. Even in his firmness and even in his rebukes, there was a gentleness ministered to many needy souls. Here's Christ, easy to be entreated, in his case, so approachable by those who were his enemies, and yet he would hear and respond and bless his compassionate healing ministry to friend and foe alike, full of mercy and good fruits. These words, you could... You could uh, sit with this verse in front of you at home and just apply these words to Jesus Christ himself and reflect on them and thank him as your saviour and worship him. It's not the primary purpose of the verses, but what a description of Christ, the embodiment of wisdom from above without partiality, Jew and Gentile alike, he helped, and without hypocrisy, of course. But these are the standards for us. Just look through them again, verse 17. The wisdom that is from above is pure. Make sure you're always genuine, dear friend. Make sure there are never two agendas in your heart. You're for Christ. When the devil whispers in your ear and says, why don't you do this for yourself? Well, you'll have to give up teaching Sunday school because this will mean such a devotion of time for you. But oh, people will think much better for you in your profession for passing this exam and that extra thing, some other extra thing. Be very careful. It may just be appropriate for you, but it may be the devil whispering in your ear Purity, dear friends, single motive, I'm here for Christ. I'll put him first. I'll check out very carefully any proposal that's made to me which will benefit me. Will it be at the expense of Christ, my Lord and Saviour? Do you have spiritual wisdom? The wisdom that is from above is first pure. It's undivided. It's all for Christ. Then peaceable. Dear friends, is this the great thing in our minds? The salvation of souls, the building of bridges, peace between brothers and sisters in the Lord, praying for that. Are we ourselves approachable, gentle, pure, peaceable, gentle? What a beautiful thing is gentleness. It makes you considerate. It makes you magnanimous and easy to be entreated. 
Well, that includes being approachable, but easy to be entreated. Are you easily touched by your conscience? Are you easily touched by some friend or relative who comes alongside you, your husband, your wife, says to you, my dear, you shouldn't do that? Or are you prickly and proud and object to be untouchable? That's what the word primarily applies to here. Easy to be entreated. Easy to be appealed to and corrected. That's the wisdom that comes from above full of mercy, readiness to forgive, and good fruits without partiality, not only being good to the people who are like yourself, but people who are unlike yourself. We dealt with that earlier on in this epistle. And without hypocrisy, how vital and how important to be without hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is when you say one thing but you do something entirely different. And oh, how brazen hypocrisy can be. And the last verse, because I must draw to conclusion. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them, that means by them, that make peace. What is the fruit of righteousness? What a curious thing to say. James do I understand you to mean the work of salvation is sown in peace by them that make peace? Yes, that's really what he means. But why does he put it in this way? The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. He's saying this. If we're to be soul winners used, instrumental in the lives of others, our children, our other relations, our colleagues and people around us. Does it happen with us? Have we been used? Does God give us instrumentality? Now, if we desire this, it's the wisdom that comes from above that we need to possess not the wisdom of this passing world. Or put it another way. <clears throat> Here is an evangelist, and he's really off the rails. He uses all the bands and the worldly methods. He's not very interested in the wisdom that comes from above. If you should have the opportunity of speaking to him and say, look, according to the Bible, you shouldn't be harnessing your work to this and to this and to this. He's not interested in that. He's a student of this world's wisdom. Oh, but then the worldly way of doing it would be, yes, to have what people want. Give them what they want. Give them what excites them. Uh, compromise in that direction. So that's what he does. And he gets a lot of people. And you know, he asks people to put up their hands and walk to the front. And then he advertises the fact to all and sundry Last night I had 103 conversions or 10,000 conversions or whatever. Yes, but James quite pointedly says the fruit of righteousness. He's not talking about people who seem to have professed Christ. He's talking about people who have such an unmistakable conversion and change in their lives that they bring forth character new character, the fruit of righteousness. So we notice that and we pay attention to that. The verse virtually says, if you want professions of faith and only that, maybe the wisdom of this world will suit you fine. But if you want people who are truly saved so that they're still worshiping six months later, and they're different people, not just going to church to be entertained, but they've got a new character and a new way of life. If you want the fruit of righteousness, real salvation, then you better use the wisdom that comes from above and do things the scriptural way. The fruit of righteousness 
is sown in peace by them that make peace. They're wonderful words. We sow in goodwill and we sow humbly and we sow not as show-offs, but we show in line with the wisdom that comes from above. And then God will bless us. Then God will use us. I was hearing, I think it was the day before yesterday, somebody who telephoned me, who was telling me, no, I telephoned him. <laughs> but he was telling me about someone in the church who'd been saved, who was an academic in a local university and had come into the church and uh, she'd lost her husband. They were both academics in the same place and she was an atheist and she sat near to the front in the church with her arms folded and she went storming out afterwards and whoever spoke to her got only this from her that she didn't agree with anything that she'd heard. And to their surprise, there she was back next week. Same reaction. I do not agree with anything that I have heard. And she was there the next week and the next week. And she was there for weeks on end until it changed her. And she came to Jesus Christ. And she was baptized in that church. And then she started on her family. All had become academics or successful professionals, all in the same mold, atheists, praying for one after the other, and one after the other, they were coming to the Lord. Now, dear friends, do you want instrumentality? Do you want that breakthrough with difficult relations? Do you want to be instrumental? Well, the pace of these things and the scale of these things are with God. But here's the message of James. If you do and you want the fruit of righteousness, then look for the wisdom that is from above. Do everything in humility. Do it God's way. Don't adopt the worldly wisdom. But that's the message of this passage. Look through the words carefully, dear friends. Let them challenge our hearts.